praise you. We thank you for the service and that our hearts are filled with love for you. Open our hearts and our minds to your word this morning and guide Carrie as she leads us in that discussion and carrying out your word into our lives, our daily lives. In Jesus' name, we praise you and thank you. Amen. So we this week have read, by the way, good morning, if I didn't say so. I hope you're having a super Sunday. Um, we've been reading Isaiah 54 to 66, 2 Kings 20 to 23, 2 Chronicles 32 to 35, and Nahum 1 to 3 this week. It seems like a lot, but a lot of it's kind of repetitive. Before I get into that, isn't Anita, I am going to, Anita shared something with me. She is a wonderful sister in Christ on when she comes across something that she thinks is powerful or really uh, talks to her, God pushes her to share with others and she shared something with me that I felt needed to be shared with all of you. Um, it's called Taking Back the Good Book and it is from Dr. Woodrow Kroll. He's the president and Bible teacher of Back to the Bible. We, which I feel really blessed, the vision of doing the Bible recap came from Laura Deicher and she brought it to the adult discipleship team and we were all on board with doing this. Um, we're getting ready to get close to ending the Old Testament. We're gonna be starting the New Testament, the gospel, worth more than gold and silver. It is um, gonna be exciting to get into the gospel. But a lot of people in our congregation have not read the Bible prior to this. And there's a lot of people in our congregation that never read the Old Testament prior to doing the Bible recap. And everybody I've spoken to has shared, I've only heard, I haven't heard anything negative, but I've only heard that it has blessed them with developing a habit of being in God's word every day and learning and growing in maturity as a Christian by reading the Bible. So I put out a few copies of this if you want to read the whole thing of taking back the good book. And I want to cover just a few highlights from it that stood out to me that I felt was worth sharing. And the importance of reading the Bible, which hopefully all of you have discovered that as we've been going through the Bible recap and reading it in chronological order, I think is super helpful too. But there are some highlights on why we should read the Bible. Um, one, the most important is when we read the Bible, we connect with and know the author, who is God. A lot of people believe in a God, believe in God, maybe believe in Jesus as God's son, but really don't know God. And the way we mature in our Christianity and our growth is by knowing God better. And that is what we've really been discovering, is it's not just a way for us to know how to live life, it is for us to know who God is and who we are in him as well. And so that is one of the importance. Another is reading the Bible is how God fulfills our desires for him. We want to desire God. We want to desire to know him deeper. We don't want to just do it out of duty or obligation. We want that deep desire to want to know him and be in his word. When you see the Bible as a means to a dynamic relationship with God, when you see it as that, you develop this dynamic relationship then you can't get enough of him. And it makes you want to be in the word, to desire every morning to get up and be in the word. And it's, it's like a, a conversation with God. And we can't develop a friendship or know people unless we talk to them. And reading the Bible is God's way of talking to us, sharing with us his desires to know him, for us to know him better. 
And I just really have developed that as we've been reading the Bible recap. God's word is what God is. Inerrant, meaning no errors whatsoever, infallible, and it's eternal. From the beginning to now, it has stood the test of time. Even when people tried burning the Bible and getting rid of it, the Bible has never been able to be gotten completely rid of. Even though people have tried, societies have tried, it's still here and it's still strong. So his word is who he is. And it is the ultimate act of worship. We sing and worship that way. We praise God and worship that way. We pray to God and worship. But when we read the Bible, it is the ultimate act of worship. And I think a lot of people don't think of it that way. But it is a way to worship God. And it pleases God when we read his word, because he knows we're reading to want to get to know him better. So, read the Bible and be transformed, not just informed. And I hope that from January to now, you are already noticing some transformations in yourself. Not just being informed, not just gaining information, gaining knowledge, but being transformed in your heart and your mind and how you see God and how you see his word. One way to help knowing your growth, and I'm not saying you have to do this, it's just a suggestion, but charting or journaling your spiritual growth. You know, going back from January when we started this to where you are now, noticing, being mindful of how have I grown? How do I know God better? How has that transformed me in my thought, word, and deed? my actions, my behaviors, the way I think about God and the way I see other people around me. Have you noticed those kinds of changes or growth? Any comments on that? I need a mic runner. I forgot to ask for that early at the beginning. Thank you, Mark. So I would say I've been in uh, Lutheran all my life, except for a gap between when I was in college and when we had our first child. And that's when we started to come back to Christ. But one of the things that this has done, the Old Testament's always been hard. You know, the names, the names, you're like, oh, okay. This has been a way to get through it. And it has tied so many of the bits and pieces of, oh, I remember this story or that story or this parable or that parable. And I'm getting a real appreciation for where they are. And the time synchronization of it is very valuable because I can see a larger flow that ties it all together. I'll be the runner. Okay. a staff sergeant <laughs> voice when I need to use it. It worked with my middle school students really well. <laughs> so um, Mark was very, he, he's good at expressing and pulling things together. How many of you feel the same way? Just raise your hand. You don't have to talk. I'm not going to make everybody talk. Good. A few. Not as many hands up that I hope to see, but still a lot. Okay, let's get into what we just read this week. I put together a quick little timeline. So we started off with 2 Kings 20. So we read 2 Kings 20 to 23. And in 20, we learned about Hezekiah. He was a, a good king. 
one of the few, and um, he ended up getting ill, and God ended up, he prayed to God, and he ended up healing him. And Isaiah 38 also mentions that. And then um, God said he would let him live 15 more years, and, but he had to go and um, have put fig, fig cakes on his boils. And he followed that, and um, then was able to live longer. And then he kind of bragged and showed his treasures to another king that visited. And he showed him everything he had. And I would imagine, it doesn't say he bragged, but I would imagine he's like, look what I have. Look at this. Look at this. In a bragging way. And he made it about himself. And then God told him what was going to happen later on down the road. So Hezekiah ends up dying, and his son Manasseh takes over. And he is, and I'm not going to go into great detail. You guys read this. You know what you read. Um, but I just want to do a quick review. So Manasseh, his son, and this is important because we're going to be having a discussion question later, um, was very wicked. And... You know, it is a sin to turn away from God, but it's an even greater sin when you lead others astray from God as a leader. As a leader, you have a great responsibility. And when you're a leader for God, you have a really great responsibility to not lead others away from God. And that is an even bigger sin. And so Manasseh led the whole um, country away from God. And then in there is Nahum's prophecy about the fall to Nineveh. And I find, I, I found this so interesting because Nineveh already had somebody prophesy to them. Jonah had prophesied to Nineveh and they repented and they turned back to God and they were saved. And then what did they do? They went astray again and had to have another prophet come and tell them, you're going to be gone. You blew it, basically. So Nineveh, I just wanted to give you an idea of where it is. You see the red kind of balloon up there. That is present-day Iraq, and it is where Mosul, M-O-S-U-L, is located now. The current city is right around where Nineveh was. And if you go down to where the two rivers meet in that square below, um, the two rivers come together there at the point and come into one river. That is where Kuwait is. It's a tiny little country kind of in that area there. I find it helpful to kind of get an idea of when they talk about the cities in the Bible, I, I, it helps me understand it better when I can look at where it is present day. Like what area in that region exactly where is that? And then Iran are the mountains up there to the uh, north. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, that's where Iran is. And then if you go over to the Northwest, that's where Syria is. So then we get Josiah. He was a good king, and he um, is called one of the best kings for cleaning out the country and turning every. So I've been working on patience for a long time, and God has really grown me in patience, and I feel like today I'm still needing some more tests in patience. 
think God's saying, uh, you still need to, to grow in patience and flexibility. <laughs> so Josiah um, is a good king. He becomes king after Manasseh. And he starts to, he wants to turn back to God. And he starts to do temple repair. And he sends his priest, Hilkiah, to um, go into the temple and find money. They were looking for money and treasures. And they were going to use that to rebuild and clean up and, uh, the temple. And Hilkiah finds the lost book of the law. And the way this is described in here, it tells me that they had forgotten all about it, that the law had not been being taught. And so one of the reasons the people turned away from God is because they weren't being taught the law. They were not being taught God's word. And so he finds it, Josiah reads it, he tears his clothes, and you know that's how they grieved and showed their emotion in a very intense way and read it and then read it to the people. And then he went and he cleaned out everything, all of the idols and all of that. And then they go back to celebrating the Passover again, and they had not celebrated that in years. And so Josiah turned everything around. And then he gets killed. And when you first read that, I don't know if you guys thought, why did he have to die? Everything's going so well. And we tend to look at death as a bad thing. Um, a lot of people, even if you have a strong faith, fear death. And when we lose loved ones, we grieve, which is very natural. But then sometimes we get angry. But I look at death as a good thing. Josiah was for God. He had a strong faith, and so he was called home, and I find that a good thing. If you have a faith, you should welcome death and see it as a good thing. If you don't have faith, well, then yes, it should be very scary, um, but people who don't have faith don't know that it's very scary. They don't know where they're going to be go going or don't believe it. Did you have something? Uh, Josiah was so good at wiping out evil. I mean, he destroyed everything. And he thought Egypt was evil. So he thought he would get into battle and destroy the king of Egypt. But Necho told him not to. He didn't listen. So he got killed. So um, we gotta be, you got to be careful what we, what we get involved in, even though we could be jealous of God. That is a good point. We are human. We are fallible. God is infallible. And so sometimes we jump ahead and forget to wait for God. So Josiah got killed. And then he had two sons. And the first one, Jehoahaz, um, was named king. And he only ruled for three months because then the king of Egypt, Pharaoh of Egypt, Necho, wanted the other son to be in place because the other son would, I think, do what he wanted. Jehoahaz did what was evil inside of the Lord as well. He only ruled for three months. The Pharaoh of Egypt took him away. And then we have Jehoiakim. It is, I think, when you read God's word, important to know how to enunciate correctly. And some of these words are very hard. So I looked it up, and it still is hard for me to say it. It doesn't roll off my tongue naturally, but it's Jehoiakim. And he ruled. He, was only, he ruled also for a long time, but he was under Pharaoh's thumb, I guess. There was probably bribery happening, and... He kind of followed Pharaoh, did what was evil in sight of the Lord. 
So my question to you. So we have Hezekiah, who was a good king, and his son Manasseh took over and was a very bad king. And then we have Josiah, who was an excellent king, really followed the Lord, cleaned out all the evil in the land. His sons had to have witnessed all of this. But then they did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And we know from studying about King David, a lot of times the kings are not super involved with their children. And they send them off to be for their education. Why, or how does this example of Josiah and his two sons, and I also want to say Hezekiah and his son, how does it show the importance of raising our children in the Lord ourselves? I know when I used to, I used to work at Ascension, which was a Catholic school, and a lot of parents would send their kids to the school wanting the school to teach them about God. But they weren't faith, a lot of them were not, not all of them, but I, I know of quite a few that were not faithful at home. They wanted the school to do it. They didn't want to have to be the one to do it. And they weren't going to church regularly. They weren't taking their kids to church. They sent them off to school hoping they would get the education they needed at school. Why is it important that we model and are the biggest part of educating our children in the Lord? Were you raising? What I noticed was that these kings, they had so many wives and they took them from foreign countries. So those foreign wives were raising the children and teaching them. And they're the reason why the children went astray because the mothers were teaching them not of God, but of all these other idols and stuff. I wonder what Josiah's wives were thinking when he started cleaning out all of the stuff. Again, what I would, they got caught up in the world ways we can easily do where you want to say that. Yeah, I think you, you learn more as children. You catch it more with how their action is rather than what they say. But it's interesting that you bring that up. And I, I agree with Pat. It always mentions, uh, like the son of Josiah and forth, it always mentions the mother. It doesn't give us whether they were idol worshipers, but you tend to kind of think that after a while because they go astray. There's an article in the present Lutheran Witness that addresses this whole issue on the parents' role in teaching their children, not the schools. Now, I'm not bringing this up to make anyone feel guilty. I did not raise my son in the Lord. I didn't know God as well. I wasn't regular church goer when my son was little and we came to church once in a while I didn't do a good job of raising him to know God and I used to feel guilty about that I don't anymore I have turned him over to God and I have prayed that people will be put into his life and before it's too late he will accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior we have conversations now he went off to college and got even further away, and I wasn't there guiding him. Now I'm a good role model, but this conversation isn't to make anyone feel guilty if you haven't been doing it, or if you have been and your child still uh, walks away. The world is a powerful, has a powerful pull, and it can be hard. So what I did that helped, is that working now? Oh, okay. Yes, it is. Okay. So what I have done is I've turned him over to God. I pray to God every single morning when I pray that he will put, he will put a strong desire in his heart and mind to want to know the Lord and make that change. That's the power I have now. Um, so this isn't a, to be a guilt trip or anything like that. To answer your original uh, question, to come back to it, uh, the I think we've all heard the phrase more is caught than taught. Yes. And so the example is more powerful than the words, especially if you, as imperfect beings, we're all going to flunk this. 
Um, you can't walk the walk all the time, but you try. And if you only talk the talk without walking the walk, it's useless, frankly. Our kids um, are smarter than we think. Yeah, they, and they, they pay attention. Right, yeah. And that is the value. I'm, I'm not making a commercial message, but um, having gone through our confirmation program with our offspring, the value of the parents being present. Uh, you got to be present to win is the title of the book. And <clears throat> you got to be there. Yeah. You got to be there. And so they see you modeling the, the necessity of attending, of being, of being present, of being involved. So. And it's never too late either. Thank you. Our presence really makes a difference. Any other thoughts or comments? Questions? Also, one of the things about those of our children who are not walking with God, it is the will of God that they would come to know him. So when you're praying that, you know you're in the will of God. Yeah. So in God's perfect timing, at some time point, you have great confidence that will happen. And I'm an example of that. That's why I do pray and turn him over, because I didn't grow up knowing the Lord. And as an adult, God brought me to him in a powerful way. So, and when we do mess up, it goes a long way to tell it that to our kids. You know, I'm really sorry. I, I lost my temper. I yelled at you, whatever. Apologies go a long way, and that is another way to model um, humility and accountability and admitting when I'm human, I mess up. And having that conversation, too, goes a long way. You know, Joash, uh, of course, he, at the end, he, he started that full of pride. And I'm sure that that, uh, that too led to his, his demise, of course, as we know. But also, it was evidently watched by his uh, sons, which they were probably raised by pagans. But uh, just on the, on the subject of of trusting, you can, you know, a child, even though raised through catechism as both of my boys were, one of them became involved in drugs and prayer and just trusting God, turn them over to God, works. Because uh, he ran into, in the Navy, uh, Christian men uh, that brought him back stronger. So he's in God's hands, and I think we all can be assured of that. Turn them over to God and, and let God do his work. Thanks for sharing that. It gives hope if our children are, have turned away. And two, if our children turn away, I know a lot of parents feel guilty and think that they didn't do enough, but that is not the case. They have minds of their own. They make their own decisions, especially as adults. They know right from wrong, and um, no one should feel guilty either. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are our Father, and you know our hearts and our minds and our thoughts before we even think them, and you love us with an everlasting love, and you hate sin. So give us hearts to seek you, and minds and thoughts to turn to you, and to turn away from those things which put a separation between us. And we thank you for your son Jesus, and that he has bridged that gap, and we praise you and bless you in his holy name. Amen.